This is Macro Voices, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Macro Voices episode 414 was produced on February 8th, 2024. I'm Eric Townsend. GavCal co-founder Louis Vincent Gav returns as this week's feature interview guest. We'll discuss China, the electric vehicle implosion, and why Louis says this feels like 1999 all over again. I'm going to be doing an X Spaces interview hosted by our friend Dr. Anas Alhaji at 2 p.m. Eastern Time on Sunday, February 11th. The topic is the nuclear renaissance and where it's headed. I'll be a panelist alongside Uranium Insider newsletter publisher Justin Hewn and Copenhagen Atomics founder Thomas Jam Peterson. Follow Anas Alhaji, that's at A-N-A-S-A-L-H-A-J-J-I on X to be notified when this Spaces session begins. We'll do our best to get a link in the Research Roundup email as well, but please understand if that doesn't happen due to production deadlines. And I'm Patrick Ceresna with the Macro Scoreboard week over week as of the close of Wednesday, February 7th, 2024. The S&P 500 March futures were up 298 basis points, trading at 5,015. The breakout of the 5,000 level will lead to the attention of much of the media. We'll take a closer look at that chart and the key technical levels to watch in the postgame segment. The U.S. dollar index up 52 basis points, trading at 104.05. The March WTI crude oil down 262 basis points, trading down to 73.86. We'll take a look at that chart in the post game, and Eric will have the EIA inventory data. The March Arbob gasoline contract up 135 basis points to 226. The April gold contract down 77 basis points to 2051 continues to remain in a sluggish consolidation. Copper down 436 basis points trading at 373, a distinct breakdown of its very strong January. Uranium up 163 basis points, trading at 102.90. The U.S. 10-year Treasury yield up 21 basis points, trading at 412, a definitive trend reversal on last week's jobs numbers. The key news to watch next week is the CPI and PPI inflation numbers, Empire State Manufacturing, Retail Sales, and the University of Michigan Consumer Sentiment. This week's feature interview guest is GavCal co-founder Louis Vincent Gav. Eric, why did we invite Louis back on as a guest this week? Well, Patrick, Louis is one of my all-time favorite guests to start with. And because he has such an international perspective, having grown up in Europe and then moving to Hong Kong and lived there and lived in Canada, uh, this is a guy with a very international perspective and a particularly strong understanding of China, which I think is very important to what's happening in the macro economy right now. So it seemed like a perfect time to get him back for another update. Well, Eric's interview with Louis Vincent Gav is coming up. As Macro Voices continues, right here at MacroVoices.com. And now, with this week's special guest, here's your host, Eric Townsend. Joining me now is GavCal co-founder, Louis Vincent Gav. Louis, it's great to get you back on. I really enjoy our conversations, particularly just because you uh, live outside the U.S. You have the non-U.S. perspective, which I think balances uh, a lot of the other guests that we have. So I, I really want to talk to you about where we are in the overall big macro picture cycle. I lifted my S&P hedges this morning with a lot of uh, trepidation as to whether I was making the right decision. You know, it seems to me like it's just really hard to argue with. We have clearly a breakout to new all-time highs on the major stock indices in a year when the Fed, which we all know is more political than it admits to being, has an incentive to kind of goose the markets into the election. Um, there's headwinds on all fronts. It seems like th there's a perfect setup for markets to just melt higher. 
and to be hedged with, with the put spreads that I was holding didn't make sense. When I got your your uh, preview of uh, of a post you have coming up called Party Like It's 1999, when I read that title, I knew what was on your mind with without even having to read the first paragraph. I knew exactly what you were thinking. So for anybody it might not be completely intuitive to, What's up with 1999? Why does this feel like that uh, to both of us? And what should we make about it in terms of risk management? Well, good luck on lifting your hedges. I, uh, I hope I hope it works out. Thanks so much for having me. Look, it's, uh, I always get so much out of these conversations, and it, it's a great pleasure to catch up once again. Look, I think in 1999, for those who lived through it, we had a deeply, deeply concentrated market. It's, uh, you had a market where, in essence, 30 names were making up most of the gains in the, uh, the S&P 500. It was all about tech. It was all about communication services. And if you owned value stocks, if you owned energy, if you owned anything but tech, and that wasn't just in the U.S., by the way. It was also true. You know, you needed to own France Telecom. You needed to own Nokia, Ericsson. And people who didn't own those stocks uh, by the end of 1999 were, were fired more often than not. And the money went to the guys who, who did own own these names, and that promoted uh, further concentration. Now, the good news for you, and the, given the fact that you lifted your hedges, the market continued to absolutely melt up in the first three months and the first quarter of, of 2000. Uh, and it, and, and that, that market melt-up continued to be concentrated. So, yeah, the piece I sent you on Party Like It's 1999, I think, you know, if you look at uh, at the past year, we have had a fairly concentrated, a very concentrated, not fairly, very concentrated market. You know, up until November 12th of last year, which is really what, I guess, uh, 10 weeks ago or so, um, the S&P equal weighted was actually down for the year. Um, and of course, you know, treasuries were down for the year. So last year, you know, up until basically early November, if you weren't in the max seven, if you own, let's say, some bonds and if you own some uh, some equities that weren't max seven, you were actually having a pretty dismal year. Now, what happened right at the end of October, if you remember at the end of October, you know, bond yields were, were reaching 5% and there were some failed auctions and people were talking about term premium for bonds and the whole environment looked pretty dicey and regional banks looked like they were going to take out the lows, uh, their lows of Silicon Valley Bank. Um, the Fed basically goosed the, the BTFP program. Uh, it basically, it didn't say, look, I'm going to turn around and buy a bunch of treasuries. But what it did do is tell all the commercial banks, hey, guys, here's a bunch of free money. We're giving you a free arbitrage of 75 basis points between the money uh, you can borrow from us and then turn around and buy U.S. treasuries in doing so. And so it turns out, lo and behold, that banks really, really like making free money. Uh, so, you know, bank shares, regional bank shares ripped higher and bonds rallied and the equity market broadened out from the, the seven names that we all know into something much broader. Um, and then you get to the start of this year. And I take your point that the Fed does want to goose things up to make sure Trump doesn't get reelected. And by the way, it's not just the Fed. Uh, if you look in Europe, I think today in Europe, you know, we have the, the in June, in early June, we have the European parliamentary elections. Um, I think most most governments in Europe are petrified at the rise of the populist right in Germany, in Holland, in France, in Sweden, you name it, and very afraid that the populist right is going to absolutely crush it at the coming European parliamentary elections. Um, you also have important elections in uh, in India. And in India, you know, you have an, a Modi today that is basically, you know, really cranking up all the infrastructure spending, making sure that all the boys have jobs. And so you have a lot of very, very strong growth uh, in India. And then finally, you look at China and China's got a very different dynamic going on. But the one thing you do know about China is that right now you're seeing easing of fiscal and easing of monetary policy. So you look all around the world, U.S., Europe, India, China. Basically, everyone is easing fiscal and easing monetary policy, except so to your point, it's like, well, in an environment where everybody's trying to goose up their economy and goose up their markets, why have hedges, right? And here this brings us to, you know, what's happened in the past few weeks. In the past few weeks, the Fed has actually pulled the plug on the BTFP. Now, the BTFP program was always going to end that sort of free money to the regional banks I just described. That was always going to end in March. 
But basically, the Fed said, you know what? I'm actually raising the interest rates at which I, a couple of weeks ago, at which I lend to, uh, to the banks. Uh, so I'm taking the arbitrage opportunity away. And lo and behold, since then, what have you seen? You've started to see bond yields creep back up and you've gone right back to a market that is getting narrower and narrower, except, except that this time it's no longer MAC7, it's now MAC3. If you look at the, the names that are actually making new all-time highs amongst the, the, the mega cap tech stocks, Meta is making new all-time highs and Microsoft's making new all-time highs and obviously NVIDIA is making new all-time highs, but uh, Apple isn't. Alphabet isn't, Amazon isn't yet, Amazon may still, and Tesla definitely is not. Uh, and maybe we can come back to that in a little bit. So you have a market to me that looks like it's getting uh, narrower and narrower, which is usually not a great sign of health for, for a market. Well, Louis, one of the Mag7 stocks that's perhaps not shining at the moment is Tesla. You wrote another piece, which I really enjoyed, called the EV implosion. Uh, listeners, you'll find that linked in your research roundup email. Give us some perspective. Uh, what's going on with electric vehicles? What is it going to mean? And let's try to broaden this, not just to electric vehicles, but you know, energy transition and everything generally. We've we've seen this big push for ESG, and then there was kind of a backlash against ESG for a while. There was crazy irrational speculation in battery metals because everybody thought that you know all the EVs to completely electrify the entire planet were going to get built in the next six months or something. That's come out the other way to where copper is actually plumbing new lows now. Um, where are we in this cycle and where is it headed with respect to not just the vehicles, but the, the whole broader ESG and, uh, and, and climate driven movement that we see in the economy? Um, look, I think it's a super important question, obviously. And here, I'm, I, I might have a very biased answer. You know, if, if to a hammer, everything looks like a nail to a guy who spends most of his time looking at what's happening in China, he'll tend to identify the causes of a lot of things linked to China. So again, my answer may be biased, but but here it is anyway. Um, make of it what, what you wish. Um, I think if you go back five years ago, the, the Chinese leadership decided, you know what, uh, we, we got to put the kibosh on this real estate bubble that's forming. And so they told the banks, no more loans to real estate, period. Instead, if you want to lend money, why don't you lend money to uh, electric vehicles? Um, why don't you lend money to solar panel manufacturers? Why don't you lend money to basically whatever, to your point, ESG, green technology, whatever you want to call it? And at the same time, they push that message down to the provincial governments, the municipal governments, so much so that every basically Tom, Dick and Harry in China decides, OK, I've got to be doing EVs. This is this is the this is the thing now. And uh, so you see a surge in loans to, to EVs and lo and behold, Fast forward a few years, and China is basically now completely dominating the entire EV supply chain, from the production of batteries to the extraction of nickel in uh, in Indonesia. You know, ninety percent of the the nickel mines are now owned by Chinese in Indonesia, and so they own they own basically the the entire supply chain, and they're now able to undercut price wise any Western producer. Uh, or any Japanese or Korean producer. And you and I have talked about this before. From out of nowhere, all of a sudden, China is now the biggest car exporter in the world. You know, three years ago, four years ago, the idea that China would be a car exporter would have seemed laughable. Uh, and now nobody's laughing. In fact, you might have seen that 10 years ago, Elon Musk was asked about Chinese EVs and laughed uh, on an ABC interview. And now fast forward today, and he's asking for tariffs to be implemented against Chinese cars. So I highlight this because this now creates a real quandary for Western policymakers. You know, Western policymakers have spent the past 10 years telling everyone, stop buying uh, internal combustion engine cars, buy electric cars. Electric cars are the future. Electric cars are good. Electric cars are healthy. Uh, electric cars are the salvation. Now, if you're a Western policymaker and you say this, in essence, what you're saying is buy a Chinese car because that's what it, it will increasingly come down to. So now if you're France, if you're Germany, if you're Britain, if you're the US, do you want to live in a future where the entire auto industry is controlled by China? I think for most policymakers, that's a nightmare. Um, that can't happen. So uh, 
de facto, you, I think you have no choice but to pull back on the whole idea of, oh, we need to make every car electric. Because if you say we need to make every car electric, you're in essence saying we need to make every car Chinese, which again, is just, is just not, not possible. Now, add on to this, to this sort of very political reality, the simple truth that if you're buying a, a, an electric car and you've got a problem with it, you get in an accident, the repair costs are massive. That if you live in a cold country, they don't work very well. That if you, um, if you want to uh, sell it, the secondhand market is really pretty poor and the write-offs on it are terrible because nobody wants to buy a three or four-year electric car because they know that then the battery starts start deteriorating pretty fast and changing the battery costs as much as the car. You add all of these things up and I think that the demand for, for electric cars is basically going to under undercut for for years to come what, what the projections were at the same time as you've got all this capacity coming so what does this mean this means price wars this means margins getting destroyed and this is already starting partly because all the chinese producers are massively cashed up they're cashed up not because they've been generating terrific cash flows they're cashed up because they've been able to tap massive amounts of bank credit. And by the way, the same is true for solar panels, for, for a lot of things. And so the whole, you know, let, let's push ESG, let's push environmental solutions to the extent that now China's captured these industries, puts a whole question mark on, on policymakers as to whether they want to pursue down this track or actually back off. And you've already seen the UK back off. And I think most of the European Union is starting to think, okay, hold on. This makes absolutely no no economic sense whatsoever. We need to be less, uh, you know, less crazy about this. Louis, let's reframe this around commodity markets and what we should expect. You know, for a while, there was a, a big investing trend around battery metals for EVs, copper also for, for the energy transition and EV revolution and so forth. Based on your analysis of what's going on with the EV market and how it's changing, what does that say in, say, a, a mid to, to long-term forecast for these various different commodities? I'm actually still very bullish commodities, and I'm still very bullish copper and nickel and tin and pretty much any metal you care to think of. Not so much because of the EV transition or ESG constraints, et cetera, because I do think these are becoming politically untenable. Um, but I'm bullish for a very different reason. And you and I have discussed this in the past, but my core belief is that the big growth story of the next five to 10 years is basically the, the, the growth in infrastructure spending and consumption in the broader EMX China space. Uh, I think you and I have discussed before how if you draw a line from Istanbul to Jakarta, you've got 3.6 billion people, excluding China, with population growing by 1% a year and incomes growing by 5% a year. And these are all people that are starting to buy refrigerators, motorbikes, automobiles, microwaves, you, you name it, all things that require you know, commodities to be built, uh, all things that are increasingly built in China or in Japan or in Korea, two countries that benefit from very, very low exchange rates today and, and thus are able to remain competitive with China's uh, big excess capacity uh, of uh, industrial goods production. But, you know, the, the simple story is this, is that China now exports cars to Indonesia, to Chile, to Colombia. And these cars are sub $10,000 cars. And I, I know you travel a lot, Eric. I'm sure you've noticed when you go to Chile or when you go to Indonesia or India, the number of Chinese cars that are now on the road. And the reason they're there is because they're cheap and people couldn't have bought them before. But these cars still need you know, some copper in them and they still need gasoline to run on. And as you create consumers out of all these markets, these 3.6 billion people from Indonesia to Turkey, uh, you know, I, I, I think the demand for commodity will, will surprise people as to how strong it is. The demand for commodity, it will no longer be just, you know, it used to be just Western world. Then when it became Western world plus China, commodity is massively re-rated. Well, now it's demand from Western world, from China, and then an additional four or five billion people which is absolutely gargantuan. So meanwhile, we've completely underinvested in our entire commodity supply. So no, I remain very optimistic on commodities. 
Louis, let's come back to China. Uh, you know, it seems just so important to me that so many people basically got this wrong. There was so much speculation that, boy, as soon as they get the COVID under control, China reopening is going to be the economic powerhouse that's going to drive the entire global economy for the next 10 years. Well, uh, guess what? That didn't happen. Um, kind of the opposite. So why did everybody get it wrong? What's really happening? And I guess, you know, what's the secret? I don't know if I want to call it secret sauce. What's the, the, the key thing that once you understand X, it all comes together and you realize why the narrative never made sense and, and why we're going in a different direction? Uh, you know, when I started in this business, my, my very first client, a gentleman called Biat Nats of Nutchtuki, who unfortunately has since passed away. But Biat told me, look, Louis, it's an easy business. You You have to remember that... You know, when things go badly, when you don't understand the world, when, you know, things look upside down, the Fed will always manage the economy for the benefit of the shareholders. And the the Bundesbank, I guess I'm showing my age because the Bundesbank still existed back then. It was pre-ECB days. The Bundesbank will always manage the economy for the benefit of the bondholders. And the reason is because everybody in the U.S. owns stocks and everybody in Germany owns bonds. And so Beat Notch told me, look, when you don't know what to do, you buy bonds in Germany, you buy uh, stocks in the U.S., and things work out over time. Uh, and to be honest, probably if I'd followed that advice, I'd be a lot wealthier today. Now, here's where I think people, and I've written books about this, and you know, this has been my big argument for the past 10 years, is that when most people look at China, they've always looked at it through the prism of the equity market. They look at it through the prism of the equity market because... You know, they're like, oh, here's China. It's an exciting growth story. And if I want to participate in the growth, I'm going to buy the equities. The reality is that the PBOC is the new Bundesbank in the system. Um, the Bundesbank is, you know, long gone and buried, uh, swallowed up by the ECB and spat out again. The new Bundesbank in the system is the, um, is the PBOC, the People's Bank of China, which manages its economy not for the benefit of the equity holder, but which has historically managed its economy for the benefit of the bondholders. So to put things in another perspective, I think if you're the Fed, you care first about where the stock market trades, then where the bond market trades, and the U.S. dollar can be the variable of adjustment. As Treasury Secretary Connolly famously told the Europeans, the U.S. dollar is our currency and your problem, i.e. it's a variable of adjustment. We don't care. In China, the order is reversed. First, they care about the currency. Then they care about the bond market, and the equities will settle where they settle. Um, and, it, and it really doesn't matter because only 15% of Chinese people own equities uh, because most Chinese companies don't fund their growth through the equity market. They fund it through, through the, the banking system. And so what you find is that you look at the past 10 years, five years, three years, one year, pick whatever time frame you want. Chinese government bonds have outperformed U.S. treasuries. Um, it's been a surefire bet. At the same time, U.S. equities have outperformed Chinese equities over 10 years, five years, three years, one year, because that's what corresponds to what policymakers were, were looking for. So that, that, that's the first point I'd make. And it's, I think it's very important to conceptualize this as you do you look at Chinese capital markets. Uh, you know, where do you want to sit on the capital market? Where are you getting the support from the policymakers? And that's why the renminbi is very stable. And that's why the Chinese government bond market is very stable. Now, to your question, why didn't China do better after its reopening? And on this, you know, I think we, we discussed this in the past as well. And I'll, I'll put my hand up for having completely missed that one. I think I, like, me, like a lot of people, I, like a lot of people, was, was a bit lazy. When China reopened, you know, I think all of us felt, oh, I've seen this movie before. Saw it in the U.S., saw it in Europe, saw it in Brazil, saw it in Australia. You, you're going to have all this pent-up demand and consumption is going to be strong and everything's going to be awesome. Uh, and we're going to have a big rebound in growth because that's what you had everywhere else. And again, you didn't have it in China. And I think the reason is pretty simple. In China, when they basically shut down, they sent tens of millions of people back away from the cities, back into the countryside. And so when they reopened and said, okay, it's safe, you can come back to work now. 
you literally had tens of millions of people that came back out of the countryside into the cities and in so massively de- and so doing massively depressed wages. This was pretty much the opposite of what we had everywhere else in the world. Everywhere else in the world, we told people stay at home. And when we told people, okay, you can come back now, you had, I don't know, five, 10% of people that said, you know what, I don't really feel like coming back. I like, you know, sitting in my mother's basement, uh, smoking weed and playing Nintendo. And so all of a sudden we missed a sort of that bottom rung of workers, the guys who work at McDonald's, at Walmart, who clean hotel rooms and whatever else. And as we missed those workers, uh, the price of workers went up. In China, the price of workers went down. And now the reality is people who don't earn a lot of money tend to spend every dime they make. So as all of a sudden they earned more, they also spent more. And that created the the boom that I think is still going on. In China, it was precisely the opposite. It was wages were depressed by all these tens of millions of people that came back out of the countryside to get jobs. Um, and as wages were depressed, people tightened their belt. And that is the, the, the cycle that we're still on in China. Throw on top of that, of course, a real estate consolidation that's been going on for five years. And you've got both the low end that's been tightening its belt because of you know, depressed wages and the middle and high end that have been tightening their their belts because of, you know, they've got a lot of their wealth tied up in real estate and they see the real estate go down. And so that's made for for a much more challenging uh, backdrop of weaker growth and, uh, of course, terrible stock market returns. Now, having said all this, I don't think we should over-dramatize either because the stock market paints a very dire picture. But, you know, you look at things like Car sales are at record highs in China today. Uh, box office uh, sales are at record highs in China today. China is one of the few places where people still pay to go to the movies. Internal tourism is, is basically back at record highs. You know, Macau visits are back to the levels of 2019 and so on. So we in the Western world tend to have a view of stock market equals economy, which is Definitely not true in most emerging markets and absolutely not true in China, of course. You know, China's had 20-year very strong economic growth and 20-year terrible stock market returns. So today, you know, if you look at the stock markets, you'd think, oh, my God, this economy is imploding, et cetera. But you'd go to Beijing, you go to Shanghai, restaurants are full, people are buying cars, people are going to the movies. It's not that dire. If in the U.S., you had a stock market that bad, things would be bad. Again, because 70% of Americans own stock. Remember that in China, only 15% of people own stocks. Louis, I've been spending most of my time recently thinking about the coming nuclear renaissance, where it's headed. And I'll tell you, I've had quite an experience because I do kind of fancy myself as a pretty darn good strategic long-term vision developer. That's what I was always good at in the software business, was seeing the major trends years ahead of other people. And as I go through this, most of the people I talk to in the West, even people that are in the nuclear power industry who ought to know much more than I do about any of this stuff, usually don't even know what I'm talking about when I explain the reasons that I think we can dramatically and completely change the shape of nuclear energy by embracing advanced generation four technologies, using molten salt coolants, using liquid fueled rather than solid fueled reactors burning waste and with burner reactor designs, all of these technology things that I know are possible. And I know that due to U.S. government malfeasance, the industry is not developing. And I'm kind of the guy who's saying, look, I can see this vision for how technologies we already know about, if we would just put them to work, can come together and create this just amazing, super economic independence picture where we could make the United States 100% energy independent, completely supported by nuclear, have, uh, you know, unlimited, and and I'm not just talking about electricity, but also producing synthetic, uh, clean burning green fuels, liquid fuels that are produced from nuclear energy. I've got this whole master plan in my mind. Most of the nuclear experts that I talk to in the West don't even understand everything that I'm talking about because a lot of it's kind of leading edge stuff. And I think, oh, I must be like a really smart guy. And then I go and I look at every single idea that I've had. It's not that China has the same idea. It's that China had, past tense, the same idea five years ago, and they are hauling ass. 
you know, I've been saying we really, really need to resurrect the molten salt cooled reactor experiment from the 1960s at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. The advances that were made in safety but were never commercialized were so significant that there was something really big that was wasted there. Well, as I'm babbling about this on podcasts, quietly, the Chinese in 2018 built a thorium-fueled molten salt reactor in the middle of the Gobi Desert just to prove that it's possible to build nuclear reactors when there's no natural cooling water source. That's exactly one of the first things I would have done if I was in charge is proving out that technology. And I, and I thought, you know, someday, mark my words, China is going to get my idea that I've already had, my best idea, which is building small modular reactors, which are molten salt cooled and thorium fueled, and using them to fuel ships at sea so that we can solve this whole ocean pollution problem, which is a, a major, major problem in terms of, of climate. Three friggin' days later, Louis, I, I'm not kidding, three days later, I see the tweet, and it's like, China announces molten salt-cooled, thorium-fueled, nuclear-powered container ships to be built. And I'm like, okay, my office is bugged, you know, they're listening. But the thing is, they've been working on this, they get it, they know about it for longer than I do, and I thought... Oh, my God, they're going to see everything that I can see. Not they can see it as early as I can, but they're already way ahead of me. And I thought, you know what the next shoe to drop is going to be in the next few years is I bet they're going to go to a full either sodium or gas cooled, super high temperature uh, pebble bed reactor. And the reason that's important is in energy transition, there are new processes that are just orders of magnitude more efficient for seawater desalination and particularly for hydrogen production where you need much higher temperature reactors. And I've, I've been thinking a lot about the hydrogen economy, solving the liquid fuels problem with hydrogen, how the nuclear energy with high temperature reactors that are dedicated to that you know, could solve the whole thing. And I've got this idea in my head that I think I'm the only guy who's, you know, ever been smart enough to think up these ideas because, you know, I'm so smart. And then the next tweet, the next day from from the Chinese government shows an aerial photo of a facility where they just built an ultra high temperature gas cooled reactor with a hydrogen uh, manufacturing plant next door. And I'm like, OK, every vision have you thought that maybe they're just trolling you at this point? I, and, and I appreciate the humor, but on this this part, I'm not kidding because I think this is really important. Um, I really fancy myself is is thinking that I knew how to how to make the West totally energy independent, fossil fuel independent, etc. Um, nobody's listening to me, so you know I'm not going to change the world in the West. But where I used to think I really had some some you know cutting edge, maybe I was the smartest guy at least in a couple of specific ideas. Now China's like a bunch of steps ahead of me, and what I've realized is they're working hard on this. And my prediction is, I mean, obviously, you know, you, you never know what's going to happen. Maybe China and Russia and the U.S. all blow themselves up in a nuclear war. But if it doesn't go that way, I think where we're headed is in 10 to 15 years, it will become the first major industrialized nation to be 100% uh, energy independent, not dependent on any other nation, which has just profound geopolitical implications. But also, I predict that they will have the lowest cost of energy of any industrialized nation on earth because they're going to do nuclear they're going to do it in scale and they're going to do it right they're going to, every idea that i've had about how to embrace economies of scale they're not just on the same page with me they're steps ahead of me and they're doing it so let's imagine that we get to a world where china doesn't have to import oil from anybody because they don't need that anymore china is an exporter of more expensive than oil but still liquid fuels that can be used to run diesel engines and so forth uh, that are completely green and don't pollute the environment and are produced from nuclear energy. So, you know, OPEC now has a competitor of synthetic uh, hydrocarbon uh, export countries, and China is the first one of them. They don't depend on anyone else for anything. They continue to build out their blue water navy, which is already very much, you know, destroy the world nuclear capable. Uh, and they get to the point where they are not just the economic powerhouse that they've been until now, 
but they almost get an immunity status where because their cost of energy is so much lower than everybody else's, their competitive advantage is so extreme that just nobody can touch them. In a situation like that, uh, the only time I can think of that's similar to that is there have been times when the United States enjoyed so much, you know, right after World War II, the U.S. never had any fight on its own soil. Europe is lying in ruin. You know, the U.S. just had massive, massive advantage over everybody else. Now, uh, American listeners, I'm sure we've never heard this before, but I know that you're from Europe, Louis. So there are actually a few people in the world who didn't appreciate the way that the U.S. Uh, took advantage of having enough power to um, be able to push everybody else around and tell them what they had to do. When China has that same power and has more of it than the U.S. ever had, um, should we assume that, that the Chinese will just be humble because that's the Asian way and not make a fuss for anybody else? Or uh, what could happen? Look, everything you've just described is, is absolutely fascinating and uh, both fascinating and frustrating. As you, as you mentioned, I come from France. Uh, in, in the 1970s in France, we used to say, we don't have oil, but we have ideas. Uh, the idea, and the idea was, you know what? We've gone past oil. We're going to invest in our nuclear infrastructure and move to a, a post oil age. And France, you know, in fairness, we, we almost got there. We made big investments. It was big capital spending. Um, we, we almost got there. We got to the point where almost 90% of our electricity was, was produced through nuclear, which as oil prices started to go up, uh, we did it for geopolitical reasons, incidentally. But as oil prices started to go up uh, in the 2000s, all of a sudden, this this was a big comparative advantage for France. And then we've spent the past really sort of 15 years walking away from it. We've spent the past 15 years turning our backs, saying that nuclear was no longer the future, and telling young people, don't go into nuclear. The future is going to be wind. The future is going to be solar even though it's a lot less efficient and you get you know, a, a lot less energy per, per dollar spent, this is going to be the, the, the path forward. Um, and I think this matters. And to your point, you know, how is China progressing so far in this? Well, um, the, the simple truth, you know, I, I firmly believe there was a, a humanist French philosopher in the 16th century called Jean Baudin saying, the only wealth is man. And you know, if you start off with the premise that the only wealth is man, the reality today is that China produces uh, more science graduates every year than there are existing science graduates in the U.S. Now, you could say, yeah, but Chinese universities aren't as good as U.S. universities, et cetera. But, you know, just the sheer law of large numbers implies uh, a situation where you just have the odds of having some, some smart guys in there that can crack codes can crack ideas. Uh, you know, you throw enough people at this, you, you, you're you probably going to get something. Now, when you compare the situation to the West, not only in the West are we no longer producing science graduates, but the few science graduates that we do produce go into one of two paths. Either they go down the path of optimizing puppy videos on the internet because that's where the money is and go work for Facebook, YouTube, or whatever else, option one, or option two, let's go work for SAC, uh, for SAC does for 0.72 or for Goldman Sachs or for whoever and, and join a quant desk because, you know, that, that those are the obvious paths to riches. You, you have to be mad in the U.S., to go work in the nuclear field. Like, who does that? When you have a government at the top that tells you this is not the future, this isn't the way we want to go, it makes very little sense. Look, like you, I firmly believe that the future of power, the future of electricity is a nuclear one. I mean, this much has been obvious for the past 50 years. You know, the whole history of humanity, the whole history of progress, you know, for 50,000 years, we really basically have no increase in life expectancy. We have no increase in GDP. We, we're basically living very Malthusian lifestyles, barely scratching the surface. And all of a sudden, we discover, instead of burning wood, we discover coal, and then we discover oil, and then we discover gas. And each time, we get better and better and more and more efficient. And nuclear was the final frontier. And most Western countries decided to walk away. And Western countries did this Emerging markets did not. You know, today, most of the world's uh, nuclear engineers either work in India or in China. 
So yes, the, the solutions will come out of this. Uh, you mentioned thorium-based plants. India has done some very interesting things there. And yes, you've also mentioned that at the end of the day, economic activity has energy transformed. Uh, and whoever has the cheapest cost of energy doesn't mean they win the economic game, but they sure start ahead on the race. Now, you know, for the past 10 years, everybody wonders, oh, the U.S. is so great. You know, the U.S. dominates everybody thanks to the tech boom, etc. What nobody ever talks about is the biggest macro development for me of the past 15 years or so was the Permian Revolution. The fact that all of a sudden the U.S. added eight and a half, nine million barrels a day or 8 million barrels a day to uh, to its production, massive increase in natural gas, collapse in the price of gas, natural gas. All this gave the U.S. a tremendous, tremendous comparative advantage. Well, what you're describing is a world where the U.S. will suddenly lose this comparative advantage. And this comparative advantage will go to the very country with whom the U.S. has been, uh, frankly, rather unfriendly now for the past six, seven years. And making no bones about its desire to see regime change and making no bones about its desire to see it stumble economically. So to your question, you know, if if all of a sudden China has this power, how will the West respond? Well, I'd hope that before that, the West would respond and say, hold on, you know, we have to catch up with China on nuclear. We have to to make serious investments here. We have to stop uh, treating the sector as if it's a pariah and as if it's, uh, you know, if, as if it's dirty, et cetera, when really it is the solution for, you know, much greater happiness all around the world. Now, to answer your question, I'm sorry, this is a long winded answer, but uh, to answer your question more directly, how will China respond? Today, China wants to you could say pretend or act like or whatever uh, that it, you know, that it wants to be a friend to other emerging markets. And so what I would imagine is China would go around to places like Indonesia, like Saudi Arabia, like India and say, hey, we can be an energy solution for you. But whether they'll offer the same solutions to to the United States, well, I think there you'll get into discussions where, okay, we will sell you our nuclear processes and our ability to produce power plants at a tenth of the price at what you have in the U.S. today, but then you have to sell us your semiconductors. Otherwise, if you won't let us have your semiconductors, then maybe we don't let you have our nuclear plants. Well, and I can take that a step farther for you, because if I was in China's shoes, uh, and I, believe me, I've thought a lot about this business model, uh, the, the way that they could structure it as they could say, look, uh, for our strategic partners, the people we want, you know, we've already built out our own national infrastructure. We've got a, a fully uh, energy independent nuclear economy in China. And all of our manufacturing industrial services are all supported by that. And for our trading partners, you know, the way we manage our foreign policy is we kind of tell our trading partners, look, if you want to play ball with us, what we'll do is not sell you anything. We'll come and build and install for you nuclear plants that we will own, and we will sell you electricity at very attractive prices wholesale into your grid. You can distribute it to you know the people of your country. Um, by the way, uh, we're not worried about nationalization risk because we use very high tech, you know, encrypted data communication command and control so and so forth. And um, if you piss us off for any reason, we turn the power off for your whole country. We'll walk out. We, yeah, yeah we, and we walk out. And if you want to be an asshole about it, you can, you can seize physical control of our reactors that we left in your country. There's no way you'll ever get them to operate again because we designed them that once we poison them from, you know, the mothership, they'll never run again. So you won't be able to get any advantage of it. So you will be beholden to us. We'll give you cheap energy, which allows your economy to compete in a way that it couldn't possibly compete. But basically, the policy is very simple, one page uh, term sheet. We provide you energy on the cheap and you're our bitch. Those are the terms. And you do what we tell you to do geopolitically, we're in charge. Uh, you know, China, Guangzhou, the, the central nation who's in charge of everybody else. Take the British Empire or the American Empire of, you know, the, the entitled attitude of telling the rest of the world what to do. I can see China very easily through energy 
providing other countries with energy that China can, you know, hold as a, a string over their uh, their neck and say, look, you know, you do exactly what we tell you. We turn the lights off. And to be honest, it's I, I don't disagree. And it's insanely frustrating because we had the options to do this. Like, you know, if we didn't go off course 30 years ago or 20 years ago, that would be us today. We have the option to do it right now. Uh, I'm working on trying to get the, I mean, in the U.S., it's just a, a waste of my breath. But my argument here is the Arab nations that are going, you know, the UAE particularly, which already has a very well-respected nuclear regulator and has gained the respect of the global nuclear industry. Um, they need to stay in the energy business beyond the age of oil. They can afford the billions of dollars that it would cost to really build out power plants all around the world for other people. Uh, I've got a pitch deck for that business model that nobody at the UAE is of, of, of import has been willing to uh, give me the time to listen to yet. But it's very possible right now for the West to still get our shit together and catch up with this. But time's running out. The way I think this goes down, Louis, I think we have a late 2020s global oil and gas energy crisis doesn't happen now, probably 26, 27, 28 in that time frame. We're going to get to the point where underinvestment finally comes back to really bite us. And we've got $250 oil prices and, and major geopolitical upsets over it. China will be adversely affected by that a little bit, but by then they'll have built out enough of their nuclear. And over a period of years, we'll get to the point where everybody who's still oil dependent has a massive, massive disadvantage. China is ahead of everybody else on nuclear. And, you know, they're not going to, I don't, I don't predict that they would ever go into the business of selling nuclear energy for a price to other people in dollars and cents. They'll sell energy for consideration. And those will be political considerations, geopolitical commitments, treaties. China will get its way with everybody by having cheap energy that they can afford to, you know, give out to who they want to share it with. Or it'll be barter. It's okay, Argentina, we'll build you your nuclear. You guarantee us so many tons of wheat, so many tons of beef, and and they'll move to be X dollars. We provide you electricity, you provide us wheat copper, whatever else, and just move everything off the dollar system. Well, and I think that the, they could very easily be in a position where they say to those countries around them, like, look, you know, this is a an offer you can't refuse. You know, you, you're, you're going to do what we tell you. The, the choice here is you either commit all of your agricultural exports, your your meat, your, your soybeans, whatever, you know, send it to us because we need those imports and make a strategic deal with us that we're going to do that in a, on a long-term contractual basis for decades at a time. Or don't, in which case we'll be pissed off, and you don't want to see what that looks like in terms of uh, what your energy picture is going to look like in your country when we're done with you. Um, they can very easily intimidate the rest of the world to do whatever they want. I think you and I firmly believe that economic activity as energy transformed uh, and that whoever has the cheapest cost of energy starts off with a huge comparative advantage. Now, today, the major economy in the world that does have the cheapest cost of energy is the United States. And that is, you know, they've got cheap natural gas, plentiful natural gas. The U.S. has, uh, you know, gone from producing 5 million barrels of oil a day to 13 million barrels a day in 15 years. Uh, massive energy renaissance, great story. With that, you know, strong dollar, uh, improving trade balances, high stock market, et cetera. Now, today, you look at the U.S. stock market. So, you know, right now, the U.S. is roughly 4.5% of global population. It's roughly 18% of global GDP, and it's 70% of global market cap for equity markets, 70, 70, for 18% of global GDP. So we have to think that a U.S. economy that's roughly a fifth of global GDP will continue to provide 70% of its profits. Now, I, the maths are really hard to make work, but it, it definitely only works if the U.S. has an enormous comparative advantage on the energy front. Now, what I'm hearing from you, Eric, is that that comparative advantage that the U.S. holds today is perhaps much more threatened than the market currently anticipates. It's much more at risk. Now, here's the thing is, if the world you describe occurs, let's say, in the next five years, where the U.S. loses its comparative advantage in energy, 
then the U.S. cannot stay at 17% of global market cap. Uh, then what's the what's the right number? You know, 18 years ago, back in 2002, 2003, following the big tech bust, that number was roughly 43, 44% of global market cap. So we've gone from 43, 44% of global market cap in, in a couple decades to uh, 70% on the back of the tech boom and on the back of the Permian uh, slash energy boom in the U.S. Now, if if you're right, if China's going to be the next economy that basically benefits from the cheapest energy around, then uh, you know China today is roughly 15 percent of of global GDP, and I think it's about six percent of global market cap. So that number will also need to shift. If China's got the cheapest energy around, then you know, 6% of global GDP, 6% of global market cap doesn't work. Well, Louis, I can't thank you enough for a terrific interview, as always. Before I let you go, though, tell our listeners a little bit more about, we've got a couple of your writings, the EV implosion, uh, and a personal note on the Hong Kong and China equity meltdown. Those two notes will definitely be in the research roundup uh, this week. So listeners, look for those download links. We'll try to get the... uh, the other piece, the the party like it's 1999 piece, I, we'll have to see if we can get that out of GavCal's editing team in time to get it into this week's research roundup. Uh, if not, just look for it at the GavCal website, folks. Besides that, uh, tell people how they can follow your work, uh, GavCal.com. I know you're not really a, a, a Twitter X guy. Uh, anything else people should know about how to follow you? Uh, I am actually on Twitter. I, I don't post that much, but I, you know, if people want to follow me, I am at uh, Gav uh, underscore Vincent, my middle name, Gav Vincent. So uh, yeah, the best way to keep tabs with us really is to go to the GavCal website, G-A-V-E-K-A-L. And yeah, you can sign up for, for research. What we produce is mostly for institutional investors, but come and check out our website anyway and uh, leave us any feedback there. Uh, always happy to uh, to engage in conversation with uh, with anybody who wants to take the time to talk to us. Patrick Serezna, Nick Kalarnik, and I will be back as Macro Voices continues right here at MacroVoices.com. Now, back to your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Serezna. Eric what a great interview with Louis. Now, look, joining us again in the post game segment is Nick Galarnik. Now, let's get to that chart deck. Now, listeners, you're going to find the download link for the post game chart deck in your research roundup email. If you don't have a research roundup email, it means you have not yet registered at macrovoices.com. Just go to our homepage, macrovoices.com, and click on the red button over Louis' picture saying, looking for the downloads. Now, Eric, uh, let's talk crude oil, starting with the EIA inventory data. EIA posted a massive build of five and a half million barrels of crude oil this week. The thing is, that was offset by an even bigger drawdown in finished products, with gasoline drawing down 3.1 million barrels and distillates drawing down 3.2 million barrels. So net petroleum production was actually a drawdown of 0.8 million barrels. Unfortunately, I don't have any data for Cushing, Oklahoma this week. U.S. production bounced all the way back up to 13.3 million barrels. That's an increase of 300,000 barrels over last week, and it's also a uh, a return to the previous all-time high. So we're right back up at highs in U.S. production. Uh, The concern that I had last week that it might take a few weeks to get back there turned out to be unfounded. After failing at the 100-day moving average and retesting all the way down to the 200-week lows, the market is trying to recover once again. We need to see a move back above the 77 spot 33 200-day moving average in the continuation chart for WTI before we can say that the rally is really back on. And that's still well above the market. But things are heating up in the Red Sea and elsewhere, and it wouldn't take that much news to move this market back into a rally. Yeah, it was a heavy sell week last week, Eric. But uh, to me, uh, there's a couple interesting dynamics I'm watching. First of all, uh, when we look at gasoline futures, which tend to correlate with oil, um, they've now fully recovered that drop. And uh, the question I have in my mind is, is that an indication that this was a, an overshoot on the downside on crude oil and we'll get back above that 50-day moving average? There's two levels, uh, a little zone between 75 and $76, where the 50-day moving average and the 
Fibonacci retrace zones lie. To me, this is the make it or break it pivot level. If uh, crude oil can't beat 75.76, and it may very well just trade to the bottom end of the trade range uh, down around $70 uh, and just consolidate sideways for a while. But if we see the bulls crack above that 75.76 level, and, and consolidate up there, then the bullishness we were looking for could still be there. And um, and we're going to find out right at this level. I don't think it's going to take more than uh, two or three trading sessions to find out. Nonetheless, uh, let's move on to equities. I want to get Nick involved in this conversation. Let's just start off, Nick, with uh, what levels are you watching on the SPX? Yeah, Patrick. So we smashed that uh, 5,000 level yesterday, which is very, very interesting. That's a key level right now with the call wall as well. Uh, there's a put wall right now at 4,500, so well out of the money on SPX. Spot price right now as we speak is 5,000 approximately. The implied move for the February 16th OPEX, which is next Friday's OPEX, is plus minus 66 points. Therefore, the upper implied move is 5,066. And the lower implied move is 49.34. Key resistance right now is right at 5,000. Very important level. If we smash above it, it's possible we push another you know, 50, 100 points perhaps. Key support below is at 4,900 or so. I'm inclined to think we perhaps see a little bit of an overshoot of 5,000, followed by a nice correction down to that 4,800 level roughly. You know, Nick, it's interesting you say that. Like, obviously, uh, this uh, is a huge psychological thing for the S&P to clear this 5,000 hurdle, and it certainly creates uh, the media hype. It's going to make a uh, great headline news. The uh, interesting part, though, to me is is that the market, uh, it, it, the S&P is not telling the real story of what's happening in U.S. equities. And so uh, I put together on page four and five just a couple charts to look at, obviously, S&P making new highs. But let's talk about a couple of interesting little observations. When you go to the S&P 500 equal weight index, which is just uh, market cap balancing the 500 stocks, that index has not beat its December highs, even though it does resemble a bit of a, an ascending triangle pattern. The other um, observation is the Russell 2000 is actually trading near two-month lows. Uh, not only uh, did we put in that uh, high in uh, late December, but the bounce that happened in January was barely Barely a 50% retracement of the sell-off, and it's now trading right back down along there, not participating at all. And so what is an interesting way to look at that is if you observe the um, uh, percentage of stocks above their 50-day moving average that I put on page five, I overlaid uh, three different versions. One is looking at the S&P 500 percentage of stocks that versus the NASDAQ in pink, and in uh, light blue, we have the New York Stock Exchange market breadth. And what you can see is that uh, the breadth of the broader NASDAQ is down to 41%. That means six out of 10 stocks are downtrending on the NASDAQ index. And I find that fascinating considering those mag seven stocks are really the biggest ones are the ones driving all the flows. But you look at it when you, uh, the broader New York Stock Exchange, which includes many of those small cap stocks, was down to 52% on the breath reading, which means that uh, literally half of the stocks are already in a downtrend. It implies to me that when you look under the hood, under the surface of this index that's rising, the breath deteriorating means that the foundation of the market is kind of breaking up, which uh, makes me incredibly suspect of this rally. Now, can this S&P 500 still put on an extra 50 points, 100 points? Could we see 50, 100? You can't rule it out. And the pattern of higher highs, higher lows, and accumulation is still very distinctly there, Nick. But this just to me spells that once the, those big leadership stocks that, that had these huge gaps higher have finished their upside moves and run out of momentum, then it really creates an environment that unless the breath magically widens, that uh, the recipe for that uh, 300 to 500 S&P point correction will be here. There's very little asymmetry in being long this market here. While it certainly can still plug a little bit higher in the coming days. I totally agree, Patrick. You know, watching these Mag 7 names keep pushing higher while the rest of the market kind of lags or declines is very, very interesting. I've been tracking these sector ETFs each and every day and, and noticing how XLK is consistently the, the top gainer while everything else lags is pretty 
pretty interesting overall. For example, XBI was down about one and a half percent and everything else was up yesterday, right? So looking at these mag seven names, you know, we've seen NVIDIA run astronomically over the last few weeks. It's gone from 500 to 700 on no actual news. And fundamentally speaking, you know, a company now worth almost approaching $2 trillion with revenues of about 48 billion and profits of sub 20 billion. It's insane. It's just absolute insanity to me. Even if they grow their revenues by 50% every year for the next 10 years, they still wouldn't justify the current valuation. So um, right now, back to the queues again, the key levels right now are the call wall at 440. We have a put wall at 400. Spot price right now is 432. The implied move for next Friday's February 16th OPEX is plus minus eight points. Therefore, the upper implied move is 440 and the lower implied move is 424. Key resistance right now is at 440 as well, where the call wall resides. And key support is at previous all-time highs of 410. Yeah. And what's interesting as well, Nick, is is that the NASDAQ, just even though it's the mag sevens that are actually the leadership that's uh, driving the S&P, the NASDAQ itself has actually not got the same momentum as the S&P. I find that uh, divergence really interesting. Anyway, let's talk volatility on page seven. Uh, the VIX is back to a 12 handle. Uh, we're back into the trade range that we've been in for several months now. What's your take on uh, what's the implied moves? So right now with the VIX at approximately 13, we can expect top to bottom moves intraday of about 0.75% roughly. Uh, over the last few weeks, the actual implied move average is about 0.62%. So what I've noticed is that we kind of push outside that range intraday. So for example, in the morning, if we extend to you know 0.9% up or down, what happens is by end of day, we usually pull back within that 0.75 or 0.62 range, which is the average of the past few weeks. I'm, I'm still seeing a lot of volatility selling on the call side, especially uh, as we approach that 5,000 level, we're seeing a lot of call selling above uh, as well as put selling out of the money below. So Multiple suppression can be expected here, but again, I'm not really inclined to see much activity until we see that February OPEX pass, after which I, I see an expansion in volatility and some more abrupt moves perhaps in the other direction. Now, moving on to page eight, we have the US dollar index. What are your thoughts here? 104 is an important technical level on the Dixie chart, and a breakout above it could signal a move much higher in the works. We had two daily closes above that level earlier this week, and now we're back below it. If we stay below 104 for a few more days, we can write that off as a fake breakout. But if the Dixie moves back above 104 and a half, that could signal another leg higher. Eric, I'm watching the exact same levels as you. The 104 was uh, where a lot of those previous highs were uh, through January, but the 104 and a half is a, a key fib zone to me. But what uh, I find fascinating is what the underpinning levels on the, the cross currencies themselves, particularly today, was a, a, a significant breakout in the US dollar yen. And uh, at the same time, the euro is trading at a very critical 107 level, which is also, in my mind, a make it or break it level. Now, while the dollar is trading above its 50-day moving averages and has actually been trending higher uh, all year for the at least uh, the first month of January of the year, uh, it's a, a scenario where we're going to get the pivot right now. If the dollar strengthens above these levels, it could be very well be the catalyst for a lot of risk off, particularly particularly in many of the commodity spaces, and maybe even the equity markets will start responding if that break happens. So uh, it's certainly something that's uh, on my mind and on my watch list. Now, on page nine, we have the gold futures chart. Eric, what are your thoughts here? As I've said so many times before, I think 2024 is the year that gold will break out to new all-time highs, and the cup and handle pattern that's been forming since 2011 would target a move higher to over 2700 after that breakout occurs. But it's all about the dollar and the timing of the Fed cuts. And frankly, I think it's impossible for anyone other than Jay Powell to know whether the Fed is serious when they say that they're probably not going to be a rate cut in March or May, or if they're just trying to contain animal spirits before moving ahead with a first cut in March. That's going to be what decides whether gold's move higher happens in early 2024 or in late 2024. 
Eric, I'm also super bullish gold in the bigger picture, especially once we have a, a rate cut cycle get underway. But on, on the short term, the price action remains very choppy and in consolidation. I wouldn't be shocked here if uh, gold had a trip back to 2000 just to retest some of the previous lows that were est- and highs and lows that were established throughout the last six months. Uh, during that kind of consolidation, I would view it all as buying opportunities. But uh, right now, clearly, gold is just not trending yet um, in terms of a new breakout, but it, I think inevitably it'll play out. The um, Just on page 10, though, I have uh, wanted to talk about this uranium chart, and uh, the uranium was a perfect buy on dip. It's holding up along the highs, and, uh, and I don't see any reason why this trend can't continue. This is the one commodity that seems to really um, uh, be marching to the beat of its own drum. A lot of the other commodities uh, tend to be correlated here and are stuck in the mud and uranium continues to be hot. Uh, I wouldn't be shocked if the, um, the Sprott Physical Uranium ETF in, uh, in the U.UN was trading at uh, $35, $36 in the week to come. And finally, I wanted to just touch on page 11, just the um, uh, Bloomberg High Yield Bond ETF. And one of the interesting uh, things that we've seen is that uh, junk bonds were incredibly strong off of that October uh, low. And uh, we had a, a big rip, but uh, junk bonds have really stopped participating on the upside, they tend to correlate well with equities. And that correlation seems to now be kind of diverging, making high yield bonds behaving far more like the Russell and the broader market than it is like the S&P. What will be interesting to me is whether or not uh, this ETF starts breaking below the $94 level accompanied by a widening of the credit spreads. Uh, uh, We haven't seen a signal from high yield bonds about, uh, you know, a potential correction in quite a while and so we'll see whether or not the price action starts to deteriorate here folks if you enjoy patrick's chart decks you can get them every single day of the week with a free trial of big picture trading the details are on the last pages of the slide deck or just go to bigpicturetrading.com patrick tell them what they can expect to find in this week's research roundup On this week's research roundup, you're going to find the transcript for today's interview, as well as the links to the articles from Louis Vincent Gav and the chart book we just discussed here in the post game, including a number of links to articles we found really interesting. So you're going to find this and so much more in this week's research roundup. Well, that does it for this week's episode. We appreciate all the feedback and support we get from our listeners and are always looking for suggestions on how we can make this program even better. For those of our listeners that write or blog about the markets and would like to share that content with our listeners, send us an email at researchroundup at macrovoices.com and we will consider it for our weekly distributions. If you have not already, follow our main Twitter account at macrovoices for all the most recent updates and releases. You can also follow Eric on Twitter at Eric S. Townsend, that is Eric spelled with a K, and follow Patrick at Patrick Serezna. On behalf of Eric Townsend, Patrick Sresna and myself. Thanks for listening and see you all next week. That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com, the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly research roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the Internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at macrovoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. 
Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna, shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC. For more information, visit MacroVoices.com. <laughs>